The Romance of the Ranchos. San Fernando, 1845. Armies prepare for Battle of Coenga Pass. San Fernando, 1874. Senator buys Garden of Eden in Valley. San Fernando, 1941. Movie star buys ranch in beautiful Valley of Homes. Title Insurance and Trust Company of Los Angeles presents The Romance of the Ranchos, a weekly dramatization around the colorful history of Southern California. Each week, there's a new story narrated in all its excitement and drama by our wandering vaquero, Frank Graham. The historical accuracy of tonight's story, like that of all these presentations, is assured by the records in the files of the Title Insurance and Trust Company of Los Angeles. These records contain the detailed history of land ownership in Los Angeles County from the days of the first grants by the King of Spain. The older ones are handwritten, of course, and many of them are in Spanish. Since many of our early day leading citizens and landowners were unable to read or write, signatures consisting of a mark attested by witnesses are rather common. In many ways, the records themselves are as interesting as the stories they tell. And here to tell the story is our wandering vaquero, Frank Graham. Buenas noches, señoras y señores. Our story tonight deals with the lovely valley we call San Fernando, but which was once Encino the Valley of the Oaks. And from the days of the romantic mission of San Fernando and the days of the Dones to the great valley of today, it is a story rich in the romance of the rancho. Our story of the rancho of San Fernando starts about the year 1790. For several years, the Franciscan friars who had founded the missions of San Gabriel and San Buenaventura had traveled many weary miles through the broad green valley they called El Encino, the Valley of the Oaks. Another mission was needed, a halfway stop between San Buenaventura and San Gabriel. To break the tedious journey and to complete the chain of missions that stretched away to the north, a party set out in 1795 to search for the site of a new mission. Into the broad Valley of the Oaks they came. Then... Padre... This is about the point where it should be, see? But we have left El Camino Real. We are distant from perhaps two leagues. See, I know. This is all right, my brother. Here in this upper end of the valley, we will find the spot we want. For it is here that the springs come down from the mountain. It is good land, with plenty of water. Many Indian rancherias. Well, the mission should be constructed on El Camino Real. You forget we do not found the mission for our own comfort, but for the good we can do for these poor Indians. He will be the better, my brother. See, I had forgotten. You are right. There is a pasture land and a firewood not far away. And rock for the foundation. Everything we need. And also, from here we'll be able to easily reach all of the Indians of the valley. And furnish them with the central place for teaching and worship. See, my brother, this is the place. Here we shall found the 17th mission. And so it was that on September 8, 1797, Father Lasuen stood before a great gathering of curious Indians. Here, my children, we have planted a great cross, a symbol of our Christian faith. May it stand through the years in veneration, and may the blessings of our Lord fall upon this land, its fields and streams, and bring this new venture a long, prosperous life of service. And so we dedicate this mission, San Fernando, Rey de España, in love of God and the name of our glorious King, San Fernando III. O oh, Heavenly Father, as we are gathered here, we 
Thanks. After the ceremony, many Indians were given baptism, and work was started on building a temporary church, granaries, and storerooms. Crops were put in, and the land stocked with cattle. The docile Indians of the valley quickly became converts to the new religion of the White Fathers, and soon hundreds of them were learning the arts of farming and building. In most cases, they readily took to the new ways of the white man. But once in a while, the Padres had a little trouble. Tomas! Tomas! Come here. I come, Padre. I come. You want? Tomas! Where are your clothes? I ride horse. No want other skin. Make hot. How many times have I told you, you must not go around like this without your clothes. It is not decent. Never wear other skin before a white man come. Good, then. You did not know any better then. Now you do. Can ride horse more better without skin. No matter. You must go get your clothes. No, no one. But why? Why don't you want to wear them? Mm. Come, tell me. Squaw, she laughed. Me, man, dress in other skin like woman. Women laugh. Me, no like. Me, man. Me, no woman. No like. No life. In spite of such inconveniences as the new clothing, the Indians of San Fernando Valley learned the civilized arts. And as the years rolled peacefully by, the valley sprang to life under their care. By 1822, there were a thousand Indians living at the mission itself, with many hundreds more scattered throughout the valley. And an accounting of the great herds owned by the mission showed rich gain. Cattle, 7,000 head. Sheep, 6,500 head. Horses, 1,300. And that is all? No, there are 40 goats, 50 pigs, 80 mules. Quite an animal community, isn't it, brother? The missions prospered, but it was not to last for long. Already the settlers of the Pueblos were forming a movement against them. Many a debate went on between church and secular powers. But, senor, you are an official of the Pueblo. We have always gotten along well together. What have you against the missions? Nothing personal, you understand, Padre. Nothing at all, in fact, except that they own all of the good land in Alta California. But we do not own all of it, senor. We hold it in trust for the Indians who were here before we came. That's just it, Padre. That's where the mission system breaks down. In the beginning, you thought you could teach the Indians to govern themselves. The missions were supposed to turn the land back to them after ten years. See, that is right. But they are so backward. Exactly. They are too backward to ever make anything of this land. And in the meantime, many fine settlers have come from Sonora, from Spain. They are eager to build a new land here, to make this a new empire. But they cannot, for they can get no land. But there is land. Oh, see, land, but not good land. You hold all of that. And you have grown richer and richer by it, senor. We only serve. Oh, see, I know. I did not mean you padres personally. We have done much good. We have turned this desert into a garden. See, see, I acknowledge that. But your good has been done. Your era has passed. It is time now to go on, to progress. I'm afraid that very soon something will be done about it. <laughs> And something was done. The Secularization Act of 1833 sounded the death knell of the missions. Their lands were taken over by the government and granted to private owners little by little. But San Fernando suffered less than most others, and it prospered for many years more. It was widely famous for its fiestas, especially the one on May 30th, when San Fernando Day was celebrated. People came from miles around to taste the first fruits of the year and to celebrate a mass of thanksgiving. Following a great banquet in the afternoon, horse races were held, and the main event was a big bullfight. The Indian tribes from all over Southern California gathered to join in festivities of their own. A great ceremonial dance was held around the huge image of an Indian chief, with a great ceremonial fire lighting the event, and cries of the dancers furnishing the music. <laughs> But the great days of the mission were slipping away. Each year, more Indians left the confines of the church 
to work as vaqueros for the newly founded ranchos. Others merely planted field crops on a patch of what had been mission land. California, under the Mexican government, was rapidly falling into anarchy and confusion. Governments changed quickly and dramatically. The differences between the Californians and Mexico mounted until in 1844, word came to Los Angeles. General Castro! General Castro! I have news from Mexico. Si, si, what is it? What's the trouble? They have appointed a new governor for Alta California. General Mitchell Torrena. He's on his way here right now. What? See, si, and he's bringing with him an army. An army? Si. He brings an army to grind us under his heel, eh? So, he is to be our governor. And this army, it is ragged and dirty. And most of the men have been taken from the jails in Mexico City. Send for Senor Alvarado. Andres Pico, spread the word. We must prepare for this. It took time to organize an opposition to the new governor. And in the meantime, he'd occupied the capital and ruled the land. But resentment against him grew, for his ragged army knew no law. Constant stories of their brigandry poured in. Senores... I did not know what to do. Here we were, my wife and I, confronted by the guns of two savage, ragged soldados. They had no shirts, no pantalones, nothing to hide their nakedness and filth but a greasy blanket. They demanded clothes, food, a horse, at the price of my life. I gave it to them. How could I do otherwise? I was helpless before the governor's troops. These things must stop. We, Jose Castro and Juan Alvarado, proclaim that Governor Michel Torreno's troops must be disbanded and sent back to Mexico. <laughs> The proclamation of Castro and Alvarado bore fruit, at least on the surface. Michel Torrena agreed to send his ragged followers away. But as the months wore on, it became apparent that he had no intention of doing so. On the contrary, he used the time gained to enlist new support. Soon, he started a military campaign against the Californians. In February of 1845, his army pursued the followers of Castro and Alvarado into San Fernando Valley. It was there that a young American approached General Castro. Castro. Si, buenos dias, senor. I am William Workman of Los Angeles. Si. You need men, do you not? Of course. Otherwise, we should not have had to retreat before those ruffians. There are Americans fighting with Michel Torreno. Si. A hundred mercenaries hired by Sutter. They think if we win, we'll close down Americano immigration. Hmm. You are an Americano, are you not, senor? Si, but don't worry. Not all Americans favor the governor. Mm. In fact, most of us here are behind you to a man. I've come to offer you our services. James McKinley and I have enlisted a good many rifles for you. Excelente. Bueno. Your uh, men will be ready to fight when those ruffians get here. See, si, we're ready to march right now. Bueno. Then we'll give them a real battle, senor. Let them come. Jose. Jose. See, si, what is it? Juan? I have news from the Pueblo. Mm. The authorities of Los Angeles have issued a proclamation deposing Michel Torreno and appointing Don Pio Pico to act as governor. Then they are behind us. Si, and the whole Pueblo, too. And the Americans, senor. Then our cause is already won. We shall ride out to meet Michel Terrena and defeat him. Across San Fernando Valley came the ragged army of the governor. Out through Cahuenga Pass marched 300 Californians under Castro and Alvarado. Soon the two armies were within sight of each other, and they lined up for battle on the banks of the Los Angeles River. What do you see, Juan? They are bringing up their small cannon. Uh, bombardment, eh? Oh, then we shall bring up our cannon. Senor Workman, you have never seen our artillery in action, no? No, I haven't. It's pretty accurate. Accurate. Senor, our fire will devastate their ranks. The field shall run with blood. Oh, did you see, senores? Their first shot did not even come near us. Now, watch what we shall do to them. Here, has anybody got a cigarette? See, si, I have, uh, but what do you... How can I light the cannon fuse without a cigarette? Give it to me. Ah. Now watch. There. General, I... Never mind. Our next one will be much closer. Hurry, reload, and make sure it's pointed the right way this time. <laughs> Since noon. Yeah, and it's three o'clock now. 
When's the fight begin? You know, the way it looks to me, they're going to keep popping away at each other with those pint-sized cannons all day. Hey, take a look over there on the hill. Yeah, they got the right idea. Lying in the shade. I wouldn't mind some shade myself right now. They look like Americans, too. Yeah, but they're on the other side. What difference does that make? They don't look like they were in any more of a fighting mood than we are. Let's go over and join them. Hmm. Maybe you're right. Looks like they're taking a siesta. Looks cool and comfortable, too. Yeah, one of them's got a jug or something. Vino, maybe. Might be. Come on, let's go. What have we got to lose? <laughs> It's almost sundown. The battle will be over soon. Looks like we are getting the better of them. Yes, our shots are coming closer anyway. Sergeant, what are our casualties so far? Two dead, General Castro. Caramba! They shall pay for killing two of my men. No, General, not men. Two horses. The Battle of Cahuenga Pass lasted half a day until after sundown that 20th of February, 1845. The Americans on both sides took no part, but preferred to fraternize among themselves. Total casualties of the battle, two horses killed, one mule injured. The next day, the two armies continued on to the Verdugo Rancho, where they fought another brief skirmish. Looks like a lot of their men have deserted them, General Castro. <laughs> Any casualties yet? Oh, not at all. Probably not on theirs either. Look! Look! They are running. They are retreating. See, the battle is over. We have won. Is that a white flag I see? See, the white flag. Michel Terena surrenders. California is ours. And Tio Pico is governor. The huge system of records in which the title insurance and trust company of Los Angeles accumulates and classifies the information it requires for the issuance of title insurance policies is called its title plant. Operating this title plant is much like operating a large bank with more than a million and a half depositors. For there are over a million and a half separate parcels of assessed real estate in Los Angeles County. And the title insurance and trust company of Los Angeles maintains a separate account on each one of them. Even though the company may never be called upon to insure the title on a particular piece of property, the account on that property must be kept always up to date. In this county, there are some 1,500 legal recordings filed daily that affect the ownership of real estate. Each of these must be entered in the account of the particular property it affects, and the entry must be made the same day the instrument is recorded. All this record-keeping entails a great deal of hard work by a large number of trained personnel. But its net result is that when you want title insurance on property anywhere in the county, the Title Insurance and Trust Company of Los Angeles can serve you without delay. And the rate you pay is very much lower than similar service and protection would cost you almost anywhere else in the United States. The same year which witnessed Mitchell Terena's surrender saw the Valley of San Fernando pass into private hands for the first time. Andres Pico, brother of Governor Pio Pico, joined with Juan Manso to lease the land. But California was not to know peace for some time yet. And in June of the next year, 1846, Don Eulogio de Salas stood before Pio Pico. You are a native of Spain, senor? Si. I come here straight in 1836. And you want to buy this Rancho Exmission de San Fernando? Uh, See, si, that is why I'm here. Well, you understand that ranchos are not usually sold, but granted upon application to the government. See, si, I know, but I heard that this one was to be. I, I do not know why. I will tell you. You know, of course, that there is talk of war between Mexico and the United States. Ah, uh, see, si. Seems si, such. The armies of the United States will probably try to occupy California. See, si, and many people, Californians as well as Americanos, will welcome them. That may be. But I have orders from the Minister of War and Marine to raise the necessary funds for our defense in any way that I can. This is one way. See, si. and my money will help, hmm? The price is agreed. 14,000 pesos for 13 square leagues of land. Very well. I shall give you the deed, but only on one condition. What is that? That you shall agree to care for the old Indians living there and respect their right to plant crops. Oh, see, si, I agree. There's plenty of land for that. Also, the church and its grounds are to be reserved together with sustenance and lodgings for the Father Minister. That too. Then, the Rancho Exmission de San Fernando is yours, Senor Salas. And may these sales help us to do what we must. Fight the Americanos? See, si. 
Whether it is the right thing to do or not, I do not know. But as governor of this province, I cannot fail to do my duty to the Constitution. We must prepare to fight. War broke out. In January of 1847, Stockton and Kearney again took Los Angeles after the battles of San Gabriel and La Mesa. The Californians camped on Julio Verdugo's Rancho San Rafael to the east and debated what to do. It was there that word came of Colonel Fremont's arrival at the mission of San Fernando. With Fremont at San Fernando and the others at Los Angeles, we are trapped in El Pico. See, si, Henry Castro. It looks like our course is hopeless. You, you do not propose to surrender. And accept Commodore Stockton's terms? No. But our men are deserting us. They say it is no use. And the Americanos, ah, there are too many of them. See, si, I do not, not know what to do. I can only hope that somehow, somewhere, we will find a way out. And the way out for the defeated Californians was being prepared at Mission San Fernando, where Colonel Fremont spoke with a young Californian, Jesus Pico. Do you intend to push on after you arrested Colonel Fremont? No, Don Jesus. I see no need for further fighting. Looks to me like it's all over. Oh, I'm glad to hear that, but, but my countrymen are still in arms. They expect to be attacked. I know. They know they're beaten, but they don't know what to do about it. There's something pretty gallant about their holding out to the bitter end. I oh, see. They are fine people, Colonel Fremont. Not rebels. I know that, senor. I want to avoid any more trouble for them if I can. I want to give them a chance for an honorable surrender. Oh, Commodore Stockton has given them terms of surrender. I know. How can they ask them to deliver up their lead? To be tried and sentenced like a like common criminal. I know how you feel, Don Jesus. I think I have the answer. I think that I'll offer them terms, too. My terms. Colonel Fremont. Your terms? They won't be the same as Stockton, senor. I want to see this thing ended with as little bad feeling as possible. I know that you Californians and we Americans can get together and make something of this country. I want to see that. Ah, oh, see, si, Colonel Fremont, you are a good man. Would you do something for me, Don Jesus? Oh, anything. You have saved my life. I will do anything. Thank you. I believe you are the man to talk to your country. I do not like to ask it. I know that they may harbor ill feelings toward you because of your friendship with me. Ah, it does not matter. If I can help you, unto I shall be helping them and my country. That is right. And I ask you to carry my terms to General Pico. There shall be an armistice ending the war in California. And then everybody may return to their homes as before. No one shall be arrested. Quarrel will be forgotten. Oh, senor, my countrymen will listen to me, for I bring them peace with honor. The Californians did listen, and on the 13th of January, 1847, Colonel Fremont and Andres Pico met at the old Cahuenga Ranch House, now a park opposite Universal Studios. There, the Cahuenga capitulation was signed. Uh, General Pico, now your signature here. Gracias, Colonel. Is that all? Yes, except my hand, General. Gracias. May this be the beginning of friendship and prosperity for all of us together in California. Peace and prosperity did come to the Southland and to Rancho Ex Mission of San Fernando. Its original owner, Don Eulogio de Salas, returned to Spain where he died. But from his estate in 1854, Andres Pico bought a half interest in the Great Trap. Gradually, the title to the lands of San Fernando Valley went through many hands, and the huge area was broken up into different tracts. The southern half came under the control of Isaac Lancusham and Isaac Newton Van Nuys. And in April of 1874, Senator Charles McClay of Santa Clara rode out to look over the northern half. Your idea was to buy this land, eh, Senator? Yes, Governor Leland Stanford recommended I look it over. Well, now that you've seen it, what do you think? All I can say is, this is the Garden of Eden. With George K. Porter, Senator McClay bought his Garden of Eden. And within a few months, he paid a visit to the county recorder's office in Los Angeles to record a subdivision. Its name was the City of San Fernando. Town lots were offered at 10 to $25. A hotel sprang up. Seven saloons came to life. Senator McClay opened a store, and residents flocked to the new town. Then, 
on September 5th, 1876. Today at Lang Station, the Golden Spike was driven in the tracks of the Southern Pacific Railroad north to San Francisco. Now Los Angeles has a direct rail link with the rest of the United States. The land was petitioned and the valley grew. Towns sprang up. Toluca, later called Lancashire, and today known as North Hollywood, Chatsworth Park, Owens Mount, now Canoga Park, and many others. Then, in 1903, the Pacific Electric came to San Fernando today, linking the whole valley with Los Angeles. And more settlers flocked to the Green Plain. L.C. Brand led the race to subdivide the land into more lots, more home sites. Brand Park was established opposite the old mission buildings. Then, in 1913, today, the people of San Fernando saw mountains of water brought from 250 miles away cascade into their valley, as the Los Angeles Aqueduct, one of the greatest engineering feats of all time, was completed. Water and transportation had come to San Fernando Valley, and nothing could stop its growth. Steadily, thousands more poured in to fill its towns and cities. In 1915, the greater part of the valley was annexed to Los Angeles, and the lands of the Franciscan Fathers had now become part of one of the world's great cities. Today, almost 120,000 of Southlanders call it home and find all the necessities of good living in the towns of San Fernando, North Hollywood, Van Nuys, Studio City, Universal City, Canoga Park, Reseda, Sherman Oaks, Chatsworth Park, Northridge, Tarzana, Granada, Pacoima, and Roscoe. Such is the romance of the rancho. Frank Graham will be back in a moment to tell you the subject of next week's story. Officials and staff of the Title Insurance and Trust Company of Los Angeles take a great deal of pleasure in presenting these true stories of early California. They sincerely hope that you are finding equal pleasure in listening to them. Their company's primary job, of course, its most important service to you and to the community, is providing protection against loss due to title defects when you buy or lend on real estate. Land, usually considered the soundest of all investments, cannot be picked up and carried away. But ownership of land can be lost or its value depreciated through forgery or falsification of records, or by prior claims due to mortgages, trust deeds, liens, judgments, property rights determined in divorce cases. When Title Insurance and Trust Company of Los Angeles issues a policy of title insurance, it stands between you and possible loss of your property due to such causes. Now, Frank, what's the story for next week? One of the greatest cities of our Southland, Long Beach, stands on land which was once part of the first and largest rancho in Southern California. Its fascinating story will be told next week. Until then, this is your wandering vaquero, Frank Graham, saying, Hasta la vista, señoras y señores. The Romance of the Ranchos, a presentation of the Title Insurance and Trust Company of Los Angeles, featuring Frank Graham as the wandering vaquero, comes to you each week at this same time. Bob Lamont speaking. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>